Hi everyone, and thank you for coming to our search and matching seminar. Today we're going to have Guillaume uh, to give a talk. And we have uh, and this and we are also very happy to have a lot of panelists joining us today. And if you have any question, you can use a QA or raise hand features. Um, <coughs> without further ado, uh, Guillaume, the floor is yours. And the next, by the way, next speaker is Randy. So make sure that you come in uh, join us in two weeks as well. Okay, so let me stop sharing. Okay, th thanks a lot. Thank you all for, uh, for joining. So it is, a, it is a paper on gradual bargaining in decentralized asset markets. Uh, it's joined with uh, Tai Wei Hu and uh, uh, Lucy Lebo and uh, Yung Wan In. It's going to be, a, in fact, a mix of a couple of papers. So the, <clears throat> given that the, our workshop is on a decentralized market on well and of search and bargaining, so this paper is about bargaining. Uh, so bargaining is uh, this core component of the, this description of decentralized markets. The reason is that it provides these micro foundations for how agents interact uh, within pairwise meetings, uh, give us allocation and prices. Um, a lot of it has been done on the, on, the, on the theory of bargaining. So the reason why we want to, we hope that we can add something is because the search was recently, in particular, the application to money and finance have been generalized. Uh, generalization includes uh, uh, liquidity payment constraints and a more generalized portfolio of divisible assets. Um, so the asset that's in the, in the notation on the slide, so the A now is, uh, is divisible, it's, uh, it's a real number and you can have a portfolio of J assets. So we have many applications on that, uh, many, people in this panel have been written on, on with this type of models. So the idea is uh, because we have generalized those models so for the last 15 years, somehow maybe we should kind of rethink the, the bargaining to see if, the, if our approach to bargaining has to be in some way generalized as well. So, you know, very quick uh, background. So, uh, you know, what do I mean by this generalization? So you know, we, we have this more as like going back to Diamond, uh, She Treasures Right, Duffy and Quarters, and so on, where the, um, the negotiation was only one, one thing. So it was negotiating over the price of uh, an indivisible object, could be a coconut, a coin, or a Lucas tree. Now we have something more, as I was saying earlier, we have something more complex. We have a portfolio of divisible assets that you trade for some divisible output. So we, we want to think about this negotiation using some, you know, some recent uh, development in bargaining theory. So there is this small part of the bargaining theory that is about bargaining with an agenda. So the idea of agenda was introduced in the context of uh, some international trade agreement, for instance, where you have different items, different uh, topics, and you have to decide uh, which one you are going to uh, uh, negotiate over first. Okay, so we are, we are thinking about, you know, how this notion of agenda applies to uh, the, the type of ne negotiation that we have in uh, these uh, decentralized asset markets. So the way the, the agenda is going to be described is, uh, the natural description is going to be a partition of the asset portfolio. Uh, think of these as bundles of assets that can be negotiated sequentially. Okay, so let's let, let give me an example of that. So if you think of A as, as your asset holdings, could be holdings of Lucas trees, could be holdings of rebalances. So it's a non-negative real number. We, could we can think of the agenda as some simple forms. It's going to be, you know, you split into bundles of equal size. So there will be N bundles. Uh, this n could be, you know, any any integers could be n equal one. That's why we, we typically think about it uh, now. So you negotiate all at once. Uh, n could go to infinity. That's the way we we are going to think about this gradual bargaining. But we can also think of bundles on uneven sizes, right? So we we don't we don't have to restrict to uh, the same size for each bundle. So all these different agendas I'm describing on the slides, I'm going to talk about them in. Uh, 
in this presentation. Okay, so you know, to summarize the, the presentation of the, the papers are about bargaining and market. So the bargaining is the bargaining with Nachan. With yeah, yeah I, go ahead. One, I've got a question for you. So, so, so just, to, just to get this clear in the, in the setup, I mean, that the, uh, so I was sort of puzzled. I mean, when, you know, when I read the paper about what kind of what's a, what you're thinking of as a primitive and what, what's, uh, What's kind of more like like rules of the game? So 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 I'm thinking of like uh, yeah, like yeah. when you see like uh, yeah no, like understand. auction theory. So so auction theory, I kind of know exactly what. You, so it's like here's a platform for for trading, and there's some rules about how that proceeds, yeah. and then yeah. and then we we can say something about uh, about so, outcomes or you know. Yeah. So let me let me say a few things about that. So. Um, I think because I kind of think it, it is important, as a matter of fact. So, you know, on the slides, I'm mentioning the axiomatic and the strategic foundation for this bargaining with agenda. So, if you look at the axiomatic foundation, which is the one that is developed in the paper by O'Neill and Quarters, so the agenda is part of the definition of a bargaining program. Right? So, it's not simply a new solution. So, you're not applying the definition of Nash and then you have a new solution for that. That's, that's going to be a, a generalization of the bargaining program that's going to include the, the agenda as a primitive. When I'm, I'm going to give you games, right? Most of the things I'm going to do uh, over this presentation is I'm going to give you a couple of games, two or three extensive form games. So the, the agenda is going to be in that case, you can think of given the agenda that's going to determine at least part of these rules of the game, right? Because I'm going to tell you that you are, once you have the agenda, that partition of, of your portfolio, you will have to negotiate sequentially over each of these uh, items in the agenda. Now, how you do that particular negotiation for each bundle, you know, you will, you will have to decide that's going to be again part of the game. And there will be some freedom there. Now the agenda, we are, I'm, I'm also going to talk about that. The agenda can ideally can be made endogenous, right? So yeah, that's also something that we would like to have, so we do that in, uh, in some ways in the paper, papers as well. But I would like to think about the generalization of the bargaining problem. Ryan, 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 Ryan. Can, you, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I'm only just thinking, you know, uh, there's different approach following up on Steve's question. The environment could be preference with technology, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and the agenda could be part of a mechanism design problem. So that's designed by the economists or even better agents in the model. You're taking the protocol as a primitive, I think, using Steve's language. Yep. So we'll have, I agree, we'll, we'll have some extension again. I will, I will talk, I will say a few words about that, where we would like to add a stage prior to the bargaining where the agenda can be chosen. Okay, so I feel, let me move on a little, and I think hopefully some of these things can uh, can get mm -hmm. clarified. I have one quick question, though. So the the way you motivated is it is that uh, we generalized uh, the theory of decentralized trade to allow for these bundles of indivisible assets, and so then yeah. now we also need to generalize the bargaining theory. But in some sense, the existing bargaining theory can, in principle, deal with indivisible assets already, right? So it's not that if the existing bargaining theory can only handle the indivisible situation. No, no of course, of course. You know, but this, but, uh, yeah, I totally agree. But this is part of that second, second bullet here. Yeah, I do, I'm not arguing that, you know, the Nash solution can handle the, the bargaining program in, the, in this generalized framework, right? It has been used, uh, and as well as the Kali solution. And uh, But what I'm going to propose is going to encompass those traditional solution that have been used. And I think in some sense, I think that that might explain, you know, how you should think about those solutions and where, how they come from in terms of this agenda. So, you know, the Kali solution in particular, right? So has no strategic foundation. Uh, so here, you know, we are going to use that agenda to uh, at the same time provide some strategic foundation for that. So as a summary, I agree. Yeah, the existing solution can be used. I'm going to propose something that can general, generalize the solutions. Thanks. So there will be, you know, axiomatic and strategic foundation as we talked about. So yes, the, the Nash and the Kali are going to be special cases. 
And the idea is uh, to in incorporate that into this model of decentralized market. There are different versions of those models. So in this presentation, I'm going to focus on point one. Right? So in the, in the papers, you have a, you know, different types of application. Here it's all going to be about uh, the bargaining. Okay, so yeah, there's a, there's a background in terms of the literature. You, you know, I, I'm not going to spend too much time, but I think several, several of the people in the panel have their names because they've contributed one way or the other to, uh, to the development of, the, of this bargaining theory for this uh, class of models. Okay, so I go directly in the, uh, the model, and the model, as you will see, I, in fact, only focus on the game. So it's going to be just that, that slide. So it's going to be very simple. It's going to be a, a, a game between uh, two players we call buyer and seller. Uh, that would be two goods, you know, why, one is called Y. So that's the one that generates those games from trade. And that would be some good uh, P that's going to be used for payments. Um, the, the P will have an, an upper bound. So we think of these as your earnings of assets, your, your, your payment capacity, right? It can fit a lot of different descriptions. Uh, the preferences are going to be over the, this Y and P. Uh, so UB is the, the payoff of the buyer. So it's UY minus P. US is the payoff of the seller minus VY plus P. Notice that they are both quasi-linear. So the, this quasi-linearity, so I will say on the next slide where it usually comes from in, some, in this class of models, uh, is, Suddenly going to play a role for some of the things I'm going to say. Uh, now, very common in, uh, in search mail. So you, you can see this, this description, right? Could apply not only to asset, but labor and so on. It's, it's generally enough uh, to be incorporated in uh, most of the, of the search miles, as long as you have this thing like this payment capacity, this uh, liquidity constraints. Y star is going to be the quantity that equalizes marginal utility of the buyer and this marginal utility of the seller. Okay, so, so that, that's going to be essentially what I'm going to use to describe uh, the games. Now, you know, just to be clear, you know, this, uh, this linearity, you can think of this as coming, for instance, from the, this new monetary model with two stages. Uh, the linearity is the, the quasi-linearity in the second stage, typically, and uh, the utility the, is concave utility functions, so the, red line and the blue line on the left panel is the utility in the pairwise meetings. That would be the background. So again, I'm going to focus mainly on that, on that bargaining. When I'm going to give you a couple of applications at some point, you know, this, you should have in mind uh, this type of model. Okay, so also quickly as a reminder, so the, and I think it's, it's going back to the discussion we had a couple of minutes ago. So you, yeah, you can, you can solve this bargaining problem by using some of the standard solutions um, you know, that, that we know. So one is the generalized Nash solution. So you, you take this uh, geometric means of the payoff of the buyer and the seller. Uh, you maximize subject to that constraint on the, on the payments, on the, on the use of that good P. And, uh, and then you can derive this, this, uh, this formulation. So this is your payment as a function of this quantity Y of goods that you consume. And as you can see, that's this weighted average of the utility of the buyer and the this utility of the seller. The important thing is that weight that you see here, uh, you know, I think it's relatively well known that the, the, the share of the surplus when you are using the, the Nash solution and the payoff are not completely linear is going to depend on the, on the curvature, the, the U prime and the V prime. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, mention that again a little bit later. Uh, and then the second solution that is commonly used, uh, in particular in the, in the money search literature, is uh, this, this proportional solution of Cali. Um, so you can see, so you pick a, uh, the solution on the Pareto frontier that satisfies the constraint that the utility of the buyer is proportional to the utility of the seller with these constant shares. And when you solve for it, you get that pricing function, which really looks like the one that you have in Nash, except that now the shares are constant. Okay, so there are differences. And again, I think they are going to come uh, you know, during the talk. So uh, in particular, the Cali solution give you monotone uh, payoff as uh, Z changes, 
which is not going to be the case under Nash. So it's going to be one, one important uh, feature of the solutions. And uh, the other one is the Kali solution gives you simple concave problems when you incorporate them into that general equilibrium structure. Uh, not not uh, necessarily the case with Nash, right? So there they are, they are differences between the solutions. Okay, so now I go into uh, you know our first game. So that's going, that's going to be in terms of an extensive form game, and I'm going to have the simplest agenda that I was describing earlier. Uh, so here you can think of this as only one asset, but it's a divisible asset. Uh, so Z is this unit of the asset, um, and we are going to have an agenda where we divide the, the, the portfolio of the asset into n bundles of equal size. The game is going to have n rounds. And in each round, uh, the agents are going to negotiate the sale of one bundle of asset for some output. You know, whatever agreement you reach in one round, that's, that's going to be uh, you know, uh, done agreement, and then you move to the next bundle. Okay, so think of this as, again, n rounds. Each round, you have one bundle. Whatever you do with one bundle, you know, you cannot, Get, go back to it. So it's a, a definitive agreement. What if they don't agreement. agree in a round? Say it again. What if they don't agree in a round on what to do with that asset? Usually bargaining deals with the possibility of delay. So I will, I will get back to your question in a, in a few slides. But up to now, if you disagree, that's it. So there will be one bundle that, has, that uh, remains with the, the order of the asset. I, I get back to your point, right? But the rule so far is, you know, I haven't tell you how they, they are going to conduct their, their negotiation, but suppose they disagree, there would be one bundle that hasn't been transferred, hasn't been negotiated. By the way, they don't, they don't have to transfer all the bundle, right? So it's, it's perfectly divisible. Uh, but whatever agreement you reach, whatever disagreement you obtain in one of these rounds is going to be def uh, definitive. You cannot go back to it for now. And I'm going to argue later that we could extend uh, the horizon so that you could in fact get back to it. That would, that would not change our outcome. By the way, does this actually correspond to anything that happens in the world? This particular order or? I think it does, Ronis. Well, when you go to the pub, you buy one beer, you pay, then you buy another beer, you pay. So this is like your pay, pay as you go, as opposed to running a tab and paying at the end. I mean, yeah, I, I'm happy to delay. It. I'm happy to delay it with that question, right? So, how do how do we think about, about this? Yeah, you have a large, large, uh, yeah, large quantity of assets, and you you, you want to uh, split it into smaller quantities to maybe get a better price, right? You can, you can think of uh, large orders. That's that's the way I, I would think about it. Except that here, it's in the context of a of a pairwise meetings, right? So usually you think of large orders where you certainly don't want to sell all the order at, at uh, in one time. Usually you might think of doing that with multiple uh, trading partners. Here you are stuck with one. Because my anticipation of what is going to happen on the other units perhaps affects how I behave now. It might even determine the outside option. If, if it's understood that we can't move on to the next period until we agree on this, maybe that gives me a tremendous amount of bargaining power. But let, okay, so but let let me get in the in the game because all these all these yeah. things are going to appear when I'm going to. So far, I haven't. That's the only information I gave you, right? So you neg you negotiate those models. If you disagree, that's it. So that, now the next thing is how how do you do it for each of those models? So here, for now, again, I, the the game is going to have a, that simple structure that for each bundle is going to be a take it or leave it offer. So you can you can see on the on the game tree. So the buyer is the one making the take it or leave it offer first. The seller say yes or no. At that point, if you say no, that's it for that bundle. You move to the round number two, and the seller is going to be making a take it or leave it offer on the on the different bundle on the next bundle. And again, we move on. So looks like you know if you look at it like this, it looks like your Rubinstein game with alternating offers. It's not right because you have different uh, bundles in each round. So you're, you're not negotiating about the same thing in each round and then allowing for counter, counter of offers. 
So, so far, you have a sequence of, uh, of take it or leave it offers, one for each bundle. Jan, can I, can I ask, so is there another difference from the Rubinstein bargaining uh, game, which is that uh, in the Rubinstein bargaining game, you can threat to delay uh, the agenda in some way. But here in, the, in your game right now, in the simple agenda, uh, the, the, the agenda is set in the beginning. So you cannot change the agenda, even if, so you cannot threat to delay one more period, which is equivalent to adding one more period to the agenda or. Yes, no, no. Not here, not now, mm. no. Mm. But again, I hope I will, I will get back. So I hope I, this, this thing, you have, you have, there's a slide on that. Yeah, but that's my, that's, that's my game so far, right? Yeah, can I ask, may I ask a question, please? Yes. A simple question is, I prefer Binmore's version over Rubenstein's where it's a random proposal each period instead of strict alternating. You can handle that, I presume. So yeah, I, I mean, we haven't done it, but you will see our conjecture is nonetheless that's going to give you the same outcome as we are going to take the limit when n goes to infinity. Okay, second question. Uh, everything here is stationary except for the endogenous um, amount you have after a given round because you've spent some of it. Could you deal with non-stationary, you know, outside options? As you know from the Nash solution, mm -hmm. it's embedded in a non-stationary environment which is relevant to the general equilibrium version, things get quite different. Can you handle non-stationarities like that? So, so let me say it is non-stationary in the sense that, you know, when I'm moving from one round to the next, right, the number of rounds I have in front of me is kind right. of shrinking. So right. there is that, that, that non-stationarity. In terms right. of the, the disagreement, I see, I see what you have in mind that uh, your, your paper with uh, Melvin, for instance, uh, yeah, I'm not sure about that. I mean, I think that, I think that would, that would, that would I think add. that's pretty important. We want to be able to embed this not only in steady state general equilibrium, but in monetary economics, in dynamic equilibrium as well. Yeah, to be honest, you know, I, we, uh, we haven't worked out that, I, I agree with this. We haven't worked out that, that kind of, uh, you know, incorporating these into the environment where your op outside option could vary over time, right? So we are, we are not doing that. Uh, whether we could handle it, you know, I mean, I think it would certainly make it more complicated. So I think, I think you all, all get the game, the, the superstructure of the game. So let me, let me see, uh, let me show you how we are, we are solving this game. So it's going to be solved by backward induction, right? There is a last round, so we can, we can move backward and, um, and solve for the, the final outcome for, the, for this game. So, when we are going to do this, I'm in fact going to use this object H, which is uh, this, uh, uh, think, think of this as the equation of a Pareto frontier. And what do I mean by that? So just look at the problem, right? So it's really definition of this object where I'm maximizing the utility of the buyer subject to giving some minimum utility of the seller. Notice that there is this tau, right? So the, each of these problems is going to be indexed by tau, which is the bundle size Z over N multiplied by the number of rounds. So I think of this as the cumulative number of assets that you have up to that particular round n. And mm -hmm. you know, the solution to that problem is going to be H, which depends on the quantity of asset that uh, you can transfer. No, H is a function of tau, is expanding with tau. Didn't you say it was potentially infinite horizon? Because if I don't agree on an asset, I get back to it later. That means there is no last period. No, no, so far there is, uh, there is exactly n periods. There is exactly n rounds, and later on, I'm going to tell you that we could we could write the same game with some n upper bar rounds that would be larger than what you need to negotiate all the quantity of assets. We will cool. still keep it finite, as you will but see. If there are n rounds, mm -hmm. and if this period is the only time period that we are negotiating on bundle one, yeah. If I'm the one who's allowed to talk, I've now got myself a ultimatum game on that no. unit. No, exactly. No, no, but I, I, you know, I totally agree. This is what we have. So I don't understand. Why don't you, are you saying you basically have N, a sequence of N ultimatum games? No, but, yes. there's still, but there's still the connection between the rounds, right? And maybe that's what Lone is also getting at. It's like, when I, what I do today affects your marginal utility 
you know, in future rounds. That's the link between rounds, right? Otherwise, these are N independent rounds. Yeah, right? absolutely. I mean, your, your negotiation model... references, which I think is creating the link between rounds. Yeah, absolutely. So you make a negotiation in each round over how much of the of these bundles I'm giving to the seller in exchange for some amount of output. This is certainly affecting, you know, my the utility that I get if I would consume that amount Y and receive or transfer that amount of assets. And then I will I will keep doing this. So there is, these things are are certainly not independent negotiations. They are linked by the fact that at the end my payoff is going to depend on the cumulative amount of output that I've negotiated over these end rounds, as well as the cumulative amount of asset that I've sold or purchased. So you got end rounds, that's confusing. If I just had two rounds and we're agreeing on unit one, and then we're going to agree on unit two. In unit one, who gets to do the talk first? Do I get to make the offer? If I get to make the offer, why am I not in an ultimatum game? Because I know if you say no, we're never returning to talk about this asset and next period we're starting anew. I don't see the link between periods because the asset changes. Because my payoff, my payoff you, right? It's going to be, so my payoff is U of Y minus P, right? So the Y is the sum of the Y that I get in each of those rounds. So the Y is going to be the Y1 plus Y2 plus Y3 up to Y capital N, as well as the cumulative payments is going to be the sum of those payments in, with assets that I make. Okay. Alon is, can I clarify what Alon is asking? Is it the case, question, that if I have, you know, I have $10, I bargain for one beer with the first dollar. If that offer is rejected, that first dollar is then gone. I can't use it in the future. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Because I have, a, I have a, that capacity concern in each round. So I wouldn't have enough time to go back to that particular. I didn't realize asset. that. Thanks yeah. to Lonis for clarifying that. Yeah. So, by the way, are all of these tied together? Like, none of these transactions is going to happen unless they all happen. No, no, no. All the things that you agree on will happen at the end. So, at the end, when I have my cumulative consumption, if we agreed on, you know, a subset J of the end rounds, I'm going to consume whatever we agreed over these J rounds. So, whatever we agree on in any round is going to be part of my consumption. Or part of my production. So is the only reason for a link between the periods because the utility is concave? Yes. If it was linear, it would just yes. sum. Well, and, yeah, yeah, and non-separable, crucially, right? So in the in your two-round example, what yeah. happens in this in one round versus another is going to be different based on what happened in the first round. Yeah, absolutely. So again, right. here I'm not changing the I'm keeping the exact same preferences that you know we see in the, in the class of my right. So I'm not playing with that. So yeah, the preferences are such that they depend on the on the total amount that I'm going to uh, to negotiate at the end of the end round. And yeah, the concavity is, is is key for that. The strict concavity is key for that. Okay, so let me let me move on, and I think you know the next few slides again are, are going to help on that. But so far, you know, I hope you get that that this idea of this Pareto frontier. Right, they're kind of linked to the discussion that we had. Each of these power to frontier correspond to uh, some amount of asset, right? And this is expanding because I'm accumulating those assets. The first frontier, the lower one, has one bundle. The second one has two bundles. The third one corresponds to three, and so on, right? The upper, the upper frontier would correspond to the Z units that you have in total. And then, as I was saying, we solve the game by, by uh, by backward induction. So here I'm doing it in the utility space, right? But because these are the simple ultimatum game, you, you, you could easily get the allocation associated with that. So how does it work? So here, this should be the last round, right? So here in the, in the panel on the left, I'm looking at the last round of the negotiation. In the last round of the negotiation, as we just discussed, there is some amount of output that has been negotiated and some amount of asset that has been negotiated. So there is a cumulative amount of Y, cumulative amount of P that have been negotiated up to round N minus one. And this cumulative amount corresponds to this payoff US minus one, UB N minus one. So if we would stop there, that's how much the buyer and the seller would get. Now there is one bundle more to, uh, to negotiate, which means 
associated with that bundle, there will be that pi to frontier, which is the orange one. Now, given that the consumer is the one making that last offer, it's a take it or leave it offer, then we have the, the usual thing that you are moving to pick a point on the uh, upper frontier that is not going to change the utility of the seller, and that is going to determine the utility of the buyer at the end of that last round. Okay, so it's not a take it or leave it offer, given that some things have happened in the past. Now the, the right panel is moving one round back, back in time. So now we have two rounds left of negotiation. And again, same idea in round, uh, when we start round N minus one, we start with some amount of output that has been negotiated in the past N minus two rounds and some asset that have been sold in the past round. So this determines those payoffs, those interim payoff, US minus two, UB N minus two. Now the negotiation, those, those agents are forward looking. So you can think of them as always trying to pick a point on that upper frontier, right? But when they are, when they are doing this, here, this is the producer doing it. You need to figure out what is the relevant disagreement point of the buyer, right? So how do you know the disagreement point? You know, if, you, if there is a disagreement that the upper frontier doesn't count anymore, right? Because one bundle hasn't been negotiated and you are back to the panel on the, on the left the buyer is making the offer, we move horizontally. So this horizontal move is only there to give us the relevant disagreement point for the seller. So this is in fact, that pins down the utility of the buyer. Given the utility of the buyer, the seller is going to pick the point on the upper frontier that give that disagreement point to the buyer. So we move now vertically. And now you can see that, you know, I could go to the round before and I would use the exact same logic. So I would construct my payoff through these kind of step functions. Now these days, these purple arrows, so I'm going to ignore it for, for now. Uh, and I will come back if I have, a, if I have time, but what is going to be the, the final out outcome, uh, the final payoff? of this game. So that's going to be the last term of this sequence that I'm describing on the slide. And uh, that sequence is constructed exactly the way I was showing you on the graph. So you have a sequence of payoff, one for each round. There's a teal on top of it because you shouldn't think of those payoff as those interim payoff I was describing. So those, those, this sequence of payoff, the only purpose is to give us the final payoff of that game. We start with some initial payoff, so let's say zero, right? So at the beginning of the game. And then you know, I'm going to construct that sequence with these odd and uh, even rounds where the odd rounds correspond to the buyer making the offer. The, was, was there a different price potentially for every unit? Yes. So again, in a given period, what's, what's to keep me from just asking for treating it like an ultimatum game on that unit where I just demand the full surplus, or am I actually doing it? I'm demanding the full surplus on that unit. Yeah, I mean, you, I mean it's all about what is the relevant surplus, right? But you right. are doing this. You're literally doing this because you can see that in each of these games, right? So the only thing that I did on the right panel, it was to compute that, what is the relevant surplus? What is your disagreement point? But given that I know what you would obtain if you disagree, yeah, I get all, all that is left. Okay, so that is exactly what's happening. You're just grabbing the full surplus on each unit. Yeah, yeah. So then your product- on the, Conditional on the definition of that surplus that is on the genus and depends on what is my disagreement point given the, the number of rounds that is left, yes. So then your protocol in particular, if there are big bundles and I'm the guy who gets to make the offer in the big bundle, I have tremendously uh, uh, valuable bargaining power. How were these yeah. bundles determined and who got to do the big, who got to make the offer on the big bundle? Okay, so again, I think this is going back to, do I take this agenda as given, right? So right now I take it as given. So it's part of the game. So here they are equal size bundles and I alternate part of, part of my game, but later on, I think I will have more to say because I'm going to describe a game where you can vary the bundle size 
And at some point, I'm going to say what would happen if I would let someone choose the, the, the agenda, right? So right now, I'm just describing for that particular agenda, and that's going to you know, give us some intuition for what, what is coming, coming next. So your, when point, I your, point, your point is right. So yeah. if I would have a large bundles to negotiate, yeah, I mean, that'd give me a lot of power. And you can imagine that if, I, if the bundle would be one, for instance, yeah, I mean, I get the entire surplus. Rubenstein is the alternating ultimatum game, but yeah. his ultimatum games are theoretical. Yeah. Yours are real. You have the alternating ultimatum game, but they're actually on units that you do hit. So now the game is how you're dividing up these, these bundles. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the core of the, of the agenda, so that's important. Give, give me some time and I, I will I enter into some of those issues. Guillaume, can I ask a quick question? The agenda matters in particular. So um, I guess this goes back a little bit to Lonis's early question about what, what we're trying to describe here. Um, so I understand that right now you want us to think about the N as exogenous and you're gonna talk a little bit later about endogenizing that. But if I think about one of the examples that makes sense, right? So, so maybe I'm buying some amount of assets and mm -hmm. one possibility is to do it, you know, kind of slowly over time, you know, how much for the first share of stock, the second and so on. Yeah. But then I guess an important assumption here in addition to the additive separability and all that, is that you as a seller kind of know N, right? So you know how many yeah, assets I want to buy total. Yeah, absolutely. It's so that, that, that seems kind of important, right? Yeah, yeah, whatever I obtain is obtained under complete information. So, which in, in some ways surprising that, given that you have that game that you split, this is under complete information, how would the agenda even matter, right? In some sense, yeah, so. Yeah, I'm, you're almost two thirds of your time and you're still on preliminaries. You better speed up. You know, I, I try, but not, not easy. I'm not going to interrupt you again then. Okay, but that's fine. I think, it's, I think these, these are all useful, but I think you understand what, how I build that sequence now from the, using those by two frontiers. So the, the, those, uh, the sequence is uh, constructed the way I was showing on the graph, right? So if I illustrate the bullet number one when it's the buyer making the offer, uh, I take the payoff from J minus one as given, and you can see the new payoff of the seller is the same as the past. And I'm just picking the, the payoff of the buyer to be on the new frontier. Right? They are those, these are those movements, horizontal and vertical. And that is, that is, that is giving me the, the solution to that, to that simple game, again, in terms of, uh, of payoff. Now, you know, we have, we have a lot of, a lot of that discussion about how the N matters, certainly matters, and uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you, you know, what happened when N goes to infinity in particular. So the N goes to infinity is, is interesting because giving, it's giving us some symmetry now. Right? So up to a finite N, who is making the first offer us some importance when I'm taking it N to infinity, that uh, first, that advantage that you get to the first one kind of uh, disappears and we get you know, this uh, characterization of the payoff that come from the slide I was showing before. So the change in the payoff of the player chi is going to be determined by the ratio of those uh, partial derivatives. So the way you think about this is really, you look at the numerator, that kind of uh, the key. Uh, this is the derivative of the pi to frontier respect, respect to the amount of assets that you're adding to that negotiation table. So this is the expansion of that pi to frontier. And this thing is telling you that basically you get half of that expansion. Now you can see I'm dividing by the derivative respect to the payoff of payoff chi. So I'm kind of putting this in terms of uh, utility of payoff chi. Okay, so graphically, you can think of this as we are, we are reaching some, some agreements. We are here. And then the direction of this uh, path of agreements is going to depend on how much the buyer will benefit from the expansion of the, of the buy to frontier when I'm adding assets and how much the seller would benefit. Taking half of those uh, increase in the payoff of the two players are giving me that direction. So that's your graphical uh, illustration of that solution. Now, you know, all this, I mean, looks you know, complicated to use now because the, the formula for the Python frontier is, uh, is simple, but if you want to guide how you would apply that, uh, you know, in the model that uh, we are using. So you can think of, of this as, this is like using Nash, but you would do it at the margin. Right? So instead of using Nash for the entire uh, 
uh, quantity of assets, suppose that I would do a, a negotiation of, a, over some very small bundle of size, you know, delta Z, your payment would be uh, restricted by this infinitesimal bundle, and then you would choose the quantity delta, delta Y, delta P, taking as given your marginal utility of consumption, U prime, U prime Y, where Y is what you have agreed up to, up to that point. Okay, so if you solve for that, even that that constraint is going to be binding as long as the Y star has not been reached, you are going to get that solution immediately. So you apply Nash to that infinitesimal bargaining program. And you see that the price of the asset in terms of that output Y is this kind of average of the, uh, this bid and ask prices. So the price that makes either the buyer or the seller indifferent, get half of that. Or do you get, you get the arithmetic average of those prices? The function, this pricing function I was giving you for Nash and Calai, I mean, that's the, the formula that you would have. So take the form of an integral because we, we are doing that negotiation at the margin. But your problem is, as all nice properties, is uh, the pair of monotone increasing, the, the surplus is concave in the, in the, in the asset holding. So uh, very, you know, very tractable. Okay, so that's, that, that's this first thing. So now, re remark, I think that, that came up already. But so, uh, the rules of the game. So, if the negotiation uh, over one bundle fails, as we have already discussed, the player commit not to renegotiate, right? So you have just have enough rounds to go over the entire portfolio there. Okay, so that's part of the rules. So, you know, here our view is, you know, no different than you commit to the rules of your game. So if you have a take it or leave it uh, bargaining game, yeah, it might happen uh, that uh, if you have a, a rejection, then you cannot renegotiate, right? If I do a take it or leave it over the entire asset holdings, if it's rejected, it's rejected. So no, it's no different from that, that commitment. Having said that, right, so we believe that the commitment is in fact not critical. So we, we worked out that extension. The extension is allow allowing us to have a number of rounds that is n upper bar, larger than n, right? n is exactly what you need to negotiate z, uh, the, the z units of your portfolio. You can extend the n as long as you make it finite, the outcome is unchanged. Right? Think of this as, you know, if I take, a, take it or leave it of a bargaining game, I can certainly repeat that, but right? that is not going to change the outcome as long as the same person is always making the, the offer. So in our case, uh, the same, the same, uh, the same happens. So this, this number of rounds is in fact, uh, uh, this lack of renegotiation, if you, if you want, it's not critical. Okay, so let, let me, let me, uh, so let me elaborate more on the, on the game, so I have to pick what I want to show you given the last 15 minutes, but so quick comments. So the solution that I, I gave you when N goes to infinity in particular, so or especially that one, I have to say, uh, coincide with this axiomatic solution of uh, O'Neill and Quarters. So they derive an, uh, an axiomatic uh, description of a bargaining game with an agenda. Um, so we get, we get the exact same solution. So we have the strategic and axiomatic foundation. That solution, they call it the ordinal solution. Um, okay, so this solution is ordinal, and I think I will get back to that when I get into the, the foundation for the Kali solution. Now, a few things. So let me do two things now. I, I, want, I want to generalize the game, so to, to show you that it doesn't rely on that structure of uh, ultimate, ultimatum games. I will make the connection with Nash. Now we'll tell you what would happen if I would let, let's say, the owner of the asset choose the, the number of rounds, the, the agenda he would like to have in order to conduct that negotiation. So I will do one step in endogenizing the agenda, and I will give you the, fund, um, the relationship with, uh, with Nash. Okay, so the way I'm going to do that is kind of a natural, natural way to do that because we know where Nash is coming from, um, given the Rubinstein game. So, I'm going to take that same structure where you have n rounds. Instead of assuming that you have uh, ultimatum games in each round, I'm going to assume that you have a, 
uh, Rubinstein game in each round. It's, so it's going to be a game with alternating offers and with an exogenous risk, risk of, uh, of breakdown. So the C or the one mark C is the, the probability that the negotiation ends for a particular bundle in a given round. Okay. So that game is alternating uh, offer bargaining game that you see on, the, on that slide. This is the game for one round. And that's the one I'm going to repeat over N rounds. I'm going to give you the description when the risk of the, this uh, breakdown of the negotiation becomes small. Uh, later, I'm going to, to tell you that we have solved for the case where that risk is small, when that risk is not small, uh, and some other extensions. Okay, so when the risk uh, is small, we know that this, uh, the solution of these games uh, gives us, uh, correspond to some Nash solution with some appropriate um, disagreement points. So the solution to that is going to take that form. Okay, so I, I will give you a, a graphical overview of what happens when there are only two rounds. If you get two rounds, the same logic is going to have, apply for any number of rounds. So looks like what I was showing to you before with the, uh, with these ultimatum offers. If you have only one round, so you are here, the, the payoff that you take as given or this US N minus one, uh, UB should be UB N minus one. So then you just apply Nash. You have an upper frontier, the orange one, and you use the, you know, this uh, black indifference curve that represents the Nash product to pick the point on the, on the, on the upper right of frontier. Now, if I move to two rounds, kind of the same idea, I have to figure out what is the disagreement point. So the disagreement point is what would happen if there is no agreement so that there is only one round left. That's going to give us the point on the red frontier. That becomes the, the relevant disagreement point. And then we pick the point on the upper frontier given that disagreement. Okay, so which is telling you that we are going to compute the final, final outcome as a sequence of uh, Nash uh, solutions you run for each a final one. solution. Say it again. You were about to say we're about to compute the final solution and you caught yourself. Okay, so uh, not, in, <laughs> not in purpose. So here, here's where, so the, the, the sequence of Nash program that I was mentioning, right, I was representing on the, on the previous graph, so it's going to give us a sequence of output, assuming that the, the constraint on the, on the payment, you cannot reach Y star, the constraint on the payment is binding. So we have a sequence of N equation to determine that sequence of output levels. So if you look at this equation, you, you, you can recognize the, the formula for, from Nash, right? So this, terms of these bargaining shares that you get from Nash and the U prime, if you integrate, that's the utility that you get relative to the previous output level. And you can see that if I would integrate that from zero to uh, the final YN, this would be literally your utility over the, the total output. Okay, so you have, you have that simple way to compute the, that solution. What do we get out of that? So, you know, one result, which is if I let the consumer, so now I'm starting to endogenize that agenda. If I let the consumer choose, you know, how do you want to, uh, to sell your units of assets in how many uh, rounds in with how many bundles, the consumer wants to do it gradually, one small unit at a time. Uh, you can see that, I, I, will, I will try to explain, but you can see that graphically. So you can see that the, the payoff of the buyer, which is at U, UY minus P is going up as you are increasing the number of rounds. You can also see that that payoff becomes monotone, whereas, you know, when N is finite, it's, it's always non-monotone. You reach a maximum and then it's de declining. Quick intuition, so why, why is that, that the, the buyer likes to do to this, this, uh, this negotiation gradually? That's because of those shares, right? The, the, the consumer wants to, to take advantage of the fact that as long as this constraint, this payment constraint is binding, the, the share that goes to the buyer is distorted toward the buyer. And the more it's binding, the more that surplus you get. So by being able to divide your, uh, your portfolio of assets into smaller, smaller bundles, you are going to benefit from those shares evaluated at lower level of output, meaning bigger shares of the surplus. 
<clears throat> now again, you might, you might wonder, you know, how much how much it matters. So, you know, we have a few examples in the we have several examples in the paper, and right? I'm just giving you one here. So, if I incorporate uh, these uh, these bargaining solutions in, into a, a you know simple model, the, the type I was describing before, where let's say the sellers end, end with some units of a uh, thing of this as goods or assets. You know, take the preferences uh, as linear. They don't have to be linear. You know, the results would go through if they are uh, concave. They, they are linear, but with different slope. Um, suppose that the asset is fiat money. Again, doesn't really matter, uh, but suppose it's fiat money with some nominal rates I. So I inc I'm incorporating that bargaining problem into that general equilibrium structure. What do, what do we get right when we solve? If I do Nash, if I do N equal one, you get that no trade. So the, the market, this OTC market with these pairwise meetings does not function. There would be no trade in equilibrium. If you do the, the N equal infinity, right? If you do that gradual bargaining, you get the first best. You get that the one who values the good the most is going to receive them in, the, in those pairwise meetings and trade will take place. Okay, so. That would be one example of a, I mean, one stock example where, you know, going from N equal one to N equal infinity, once you incorporate that into the generative structure, does matter a lot in that case. Okay, so let me, let, let me keep on uh, with that, you know, the last time is that I have to, uh, Again, keep on with that, with that same theme of the agenda. So, and I'm going to use it to uh, now justify the other solution, which is the, the Kali solution. So, so this is part of a, a paper I have with uh, Tai Wei Hu. Uh, so very similar idea. So this is the Kali solution in case uh, you don't remember it. So that's this weighted average with constant shares of the utility of the buyer and the utility of the seller. So what, what we do in this paper is now I'm, I'm going to, to really change the agenda. I'm going to revert it. So instead of saying, you are bargaining over the Z and you are, you are deciding how to split that Z. You know, you could think that for some application, the, the asset will in fact be the Y. So if you think of the application in the over-the-counter market literature, you would think of the asset as the one that enters into those, uh, those concavity functions. So suppose I do this, instead of bargaining gradually over the P, you would do it over the Y. So now the agenda is going to give us some bundles of Y. And then you can use whatever payment capacity you have in each round, subject to that same uh, capacity constraint Z. Okay, so, and I'm going to use that, that, that Rubinstein game I was showing on the previous slide. Okay, so to be very, very, very clear, I will have bundles of Y's, I'm going to denote them delta Y bar. The, the N is going to be the index for the round. I'm going to choose those, those bundles so that they add up to the Y star, which is the efficient quantity. Now I am not I'm not restricting these to be bundles of equal size. So you can have any types of splitting or of the the amount of output that you would like to trade. And we are, when we are solving the game, so <clears throat> we are solving for risk of breakdown that is that goes to zero or doesn't have to go to zero. We can we can uh, can do it either way. Okay, and then the rest of the game works the same. So you are going to negotiate a bundle of those goods in each round. Um, the feasibility condition are going to be different, right? So the amount of output that you can negotiate is constrained by the size of that bundle specifying the, the agenda. So the delta YN has an upper bound that is the delta Y bar. In terms of payments, you can use whatever you have left. So you can use Z minus whatever payments you have made in the past rounds. <clears throat> okay, so going to tell you what we get, but first, it's kind of useful to, be, to illustrate with this pi to frontiers I was showing to you before, that uh, this sequence of a pi to frontier that correspond to the agenda, so the amount that you can negotiate in each round. So you can see that they take a, a different shape. Now they are linear, that due to the quasi-linearity of the payoff, up to the point where they reach the upper frontier. Now that linearity is, very, is going to be important for what I'm going to, uh, to derive next. Okay, so how do you solve for it? Yeah, again, always the same, uh, the same logic to solve by uh, backward induction. So let me 
these are three cases, but let, let me describe the one that you have on the, on the bottom left. So you can see I'm, I'm drawing those by two frontier. The yellow one is in fact the one that, so it's a two round. I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on the two round case. So this is the by two frontier for the last round. Why do we care about that one? Because this is the one that is going to give us a disagreement point that is relevant for the negotiation in the first round, right? That's the backward induction logic. So as long as your uh, liquidity constraint is not binding, so you are on the linear part of the frontier, the, this, uh, uh, the agreement is going to be at the intersection of the, this line, the, the orange line, that is the sharing according the proportional sharing according to this uh, weight, uh, one minus theta and theta. So you are going to pick the point at the intersection of the linear by two frontier and that line. That's my disagreement point. Once I have the disagreement point, I keep on doing my negotiation to pick the point on the upper frontier. And again, if it's not binding, it's still going to be at the intersection of that same orange line. That's like the proportional solution. Now it doesn't have to be like this, right? So the other two cases tell you that it might be binding, in which case you would depart from that uh, linear line that split the surplus according to those shares theta and one minus theta. So it doesn't have to be that proportional solution. But the logic you should still have in mind, I'm always using that same logic. I'm determining that disagreement point. Once I have the disagreement point, you know, you go forward with uh, your negotiation, which is in that case is Nash. Okay, so if I take that, the limit where the risk of uh, the negotiation breaking down goes to zero, yeah, I'm doing a sequence of Nash program. Now, the thing that is worth uh, noticing here is when I'm doing the sequence of Nash program, you can see that the output level is kind of going backward. Right? That's my backward induction. You could not see that before because I have, I have this special agenda where the, the, the size of the bundle is the same in each round. As soon as you depart from that, you can see that you know, the, the form of the agenda and how the, those output level differ across rounds is going to be important uh, for the way you, uh, you take the sequence of the Nash program. Okay, so I'm solving that, that sequence of uh, Nash programs. I'm going to have the, the solution to that new agenda. And then the purpose of that is to tell you when are we going to implement the, or can we implement the proportional solution with that different agenda? Okay, so the answer is going to be yes, we can do it in different ways. Right? We can do it with a finite number of rounds under some condition here. So if the, the sum of the output for the last n rounds last n k rounds is equal to the solution given by the Kali solution I implement Kali, right? So you need the sum of the output level for the last, uh, the last n k rounds to be what the Kali solution predicts. Now that's one implementation, it's not very interesting because that threshold for n depends on z. Okay, so if we want the, the solution to coincide with the proportional solution for all z, which I think is going to be my last result, we need the agenda to be continuous, right? So by, by continuous, we mean that you need to bargain gradually. There cannot be one round where you have a, a bundle of goods to negotiate that is not, that doesn't become infinitesimal, that doesn't become small, okay? But as long as you bargain gradually about the why, you implement the Kali solution. Okay, so my gradual solution for that different agenda coincides with Kali. Okay, so I'm happy to use my last minute. So I, I, you know, clearly time constraint, but the only thing that I have to say is, this is an illustration of how, how this agenda would, would matter. So, you know, here I'm, I'm giving you, if I incorporate this particular solution I was describing into a model that looks like the, this new monetary model, um, I'm telling you what would be the, the choice of the, of the payment capacity or the choice of the real balances as I'm changing the end. And one thing that I want to get from that picture is the result that you get under Nash that, let's say the Friedman rule give you a suboptimal outcome. So you underinvest even at the Friedman rule. In fact, this is a robust outcome when uh, you generalize the, that, uh, that bargaining game to have different bundles. It's only at the limit that you are going to get 
the first best under the Freeman rule. Right? So the idea again of using this agenda I give you a sense of what results might or might not be robust when you are uh, trying to generalize the, the way you're negotiating over those uh, assets and commodities. Okay, so I'm happy to I'm happy to stop there because I believe I'm out of time and then take the take the questions. I missed how your agendas were being determined. It seemed like because it was the alternating ultimatum game, the ultimatum game trivializes bargaining, and yet it's the only way we've, we've proceeded. That was Rubenstein's genius. He just made it the alternating ultimatum game. But so in his case, it was really natural how you split. We just used geometric discounting, and the, the future was always there for us. But for you, the, the choice of how you split seems to be everything. And I missed how you went from just arbitrary bundles to suddenly you were making sharp predictions that seemed to have made an embedded an assumption about how you were dividing up everything. So what you, when you mean the choice, how you split, the choice, how you split your assets, for instance, that's what you mean? Yeah. Do okay. I get the opportunity to make, you, know, you could just make it so that you bargain over the first unit and I get the next end units. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, let me, let me tell you a couple of things, right? Is that what we have done uh, in terms of uh, endogenizing. So I think, the, you know, we have uh, a few results, right? So that, that's how much we have on, the, on that. So in most of the analysis I was showing before, so you are, you are right. So I'm, I'm taking as given the way you split. So I'm taking as given the agenda. So in that, in that particular case, I'm, because the, the size of the bundle is the same, I'm, I'm taking the number of rounds. Uh, later on, I'm going to take the sequence of, uh, of bundle sizes as given, right? So I'm not, I'm not explaining. In that re particular result on that slide, we are allowing one agent to say, before you, you start the negotiation, I'm, I'm, going, I'm giving you the choice. It's a limited choice, right? It's not the, the full agenda you can choose but I'm, I'm giving you the choice to, to choose the size of the bundle that is going to be negotiated according to that protocol I was giving you. Right, so that's one, one way, one first attempt at endogenizing the agenda. And then what I'm telling you here is here there's a clear case that the, the one who, is, who owns the asset, he has, a, he, has, he has a strict preference for doing that bargaining with a lot of rounds. With very small bundle size. Sorry. Obviously, the uh, other one has the opposite pre preferences for the agenda. Are, are the numbers of bond units in each period negotiated? Is it always one? Is that? No, no. The no. The I have a I have a quantity of asset that is Z. Uh, if I'm choosing n rounds, this, the quantity I'm going to negotiate in each round is going to be z over n. So I'm choosing both the rounds and the size of the bundle. Okay, so you're assuming it's equal every period. Okay. Now, as you saw later, we also worked out the version where those, those bundle sizes do not have to be equal. Now, we don't endogenize that except Again, we can let the we can let one agent at the beginning of the game choose uh, the agenda. We know that in the first game I was showing you. So if I own the asset, I want to bargain gradually over the asset. If you are the so if maybe I will show you here. If you are the the seller, so you are the one who is who is producing the the output, the the good Y. You want to bargain gradually over Y. So we have that common theme that if I let one of the players choose the agenda. He always wants to bargain gradually, meaning with these infinitesimal sizes over the good that he's offering. Who gets to make the first offer, the buyer or the seller? So, okay, it depends which game, right? So here, these are Rubinstein. So here, I have a sequence of Rubinstein game, right? That's what I'm describing there. So. Okay. I believe we started with the buyer making the first offer. Now, some of this result, we remove the first mover advantage by taking that risk of uh, the risk of the negotiation breaking down going to zero. So that first mover advantage disappears for that, right. those particular results. 
So, Guillaume, I've told you this before, but I'll tell you again. If you use the random version where the proposal is determined by a coin flip each period, then yeah. you get around this who goes first issue to some extent. Yeah, and I, I agree. comment. I, I told everybody this, but nobody seems to like it. Who's the buyer and who's the seller? Those are kind of labels. I agree. Except yeah. in the monetary version where you're paying with fiat cash. You know, Duffy, Garland, Pedersen, Rubenstein, Rubenstein, Valensky. In those models, there's agents trading apples for bananas. And I don't even know what sense it makes to label one the buyer and the other the seller. Minor no, point, but interesting. Yeah, I totally agree. So that's why I was saying the good why. I mean, it's, it's always a bit tricky, right? Because in some interpretation of the model, the good why could also be an asset itself. So you, every, everyone is a buyer and a seller in, in, this, in this description. You are buying and selling, you know, maybe an asset, maybe a... Well, having said that, in the monetary version where you actually can identify buyers and sellers, it doesn't matter much, but aesthetically, I, I like the version where the seller goes first. The interpretation, if you walk into the store, there's a seller's announcement. It could be a, a ticket, a price ticket. Yeah. You take it, you're free to bargain off the equilibrium path, so there's some discipline, but it looks a bit like price posting. At least with uh, Rubenstein, I'm not sure how that works with gradual. So, yeah, no, I, think, I think it's similar. I mean, the, the, the difference is in your description, you really have only one, one offer, right? Because the offer is accepted right away. Right, right, for sure. In my description, there will be, there is multiple rounds. So you are, if you would look at the equilibrium path, you would see a sequence of offers. Now, you can, all, you can always go back to the, what you like, right? I could always add one, one, one stage at the beginning of that negotiation that would say someone is making an offer. And then, you know, if you disagree, then you do that bargaining protocol I'm describing as a way to discipline the outcome. So you, again, getting back to the, you said that the guy selling it wants to have as many rounds as possible, right? Yes. But if he was the guy who gets to make the first offer, he would want one round in which he, in which he makes the ultimatum offer. Yeah, so in order, absolutely. In order to get those results, I need to have symmetry in, the, in each round. So that's why when we get those results for the choice of the agenda, we are taking the game where you are playing the, the alternative offer uh, bargaining game of Rubinstein in each round with no first mover advantage. Otherwise, you are right. Right, so if I want to, if I want to make that choice, I mean, I have to remove that first mover advantage because if you, if you go back to the alternating ultimatum offer, yeah, for sure. You want to be the first one, negotiate everything. Yes. I so, have um, a question. So yeah. it seems to be that in terms of agendas, you consider two polar cases, one where the Z enters gradually and the other one where the Y enters gradually. Yeah. But since both of them, both uh, the seller and the buyer uh, or whatever the labels are, I would like to bargain gradually, in some sense, they're going to both try to set things up, that things are gradual. And so in principle, one can consider much more general agendas where the Y and the Z enter yeah. both gradually at different speeds. And yeah. can you then say something about the outcome? No, I, agree what, I agree what you say. So these are still special agendas, as you mentioned, right? So I, I, got, I got two ways that we need two sequence of a of uh, Pareto Frontiers, you can have a lot of, of different ones. Uh, as, as you mentioned, you can, you can imagine that if, exactly what you say, that it could be a combination of these bundles of Y and P negotiating in different rounds and uh, think about exactly, again, what you said about those P's at which you can increase the Y and the, y and the P across rounds. So that would be, the, that would be some kind of general, generalized formulation of, the, of those agendas. Yeah, so we, we, you know, we have been discussing that, but no, we, I don't have any result on that. But yeah, yeah so, I, be, I believe that would be the, the for, certainly for us, that direction to go. Yeah. I mean, it seems like you're getting something in terms of sharp characterization by looking at these uh, polar agendas, you get kind of monotonicity in both cases. Yeah, but yeah. With respect to monotonicity, you might wonder, is that, I mean, another case that would be natural to look at would be one where it kind of expands kind of in a more symmetric way, right? Yeah. Where the shape of the Pareto frontier doesn't change very much. And, uh, you know, what happens in that case? Does monotonicity survive or not? 
So our conjecture is, uh, so there, yeah, so there, there's been discussion on that. So our conjecture is uh, the, the monotonicity has to be preserved, certainly as you are, you are using the, the, those kind of gradual formulations. So as long as these increments of the, either, either the Y and the P or combinations are small, you, you, need, you need to preserve, you have to preserve that, that monotonicity. Um, we, have, we have disagreement on, on, with one referee on that point on the, because of some conjecture that was made in some working paper by the, the authors I was mentioning at the very beginning, the O'Neill and, and Quarters. You know, our, our, yeah, our view is we cannot see how you would lose that. But uh, yeah, we, we need more, more results on that. Any other questions? Uh, so Kai Wei, would you like to address some discussion about M-bar? Because I think there is some discussion there. Would you like to say something about that? Yeah, so uh, let me just say what I wrote. Uh, I, I hope uh, people can, can ask more. Not everyone so see that. Only panelists see this. So you might want I will to say, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. OK, so there was a question about why when M-bar is greater than N, we get the same solution. And, and the main idea is that uh, the agents will anticipate what happened toward the end of the game. So even in the earlier round, even though they know they could negotiate this later on, they would take into account what happened in, in the last round. It might be easier to think about the game that uh, Guillaume described later on. The, each round is they're negotiating in a Rubinstein fashion. So in that case, you, you maintain the same symmetry across rounds. In that case, we have that kind of result exactly for that reason. Uh, yeah. So, do you have anything to add to that? No. I think was clear. Okay, great. Any other questions from panelists or from participants? Okay, then, oh, sorry, I think I saw one person raise the hand. Hold on. Oh, uh, Lucas, uh, I will allow you to talk. Hello. Yes. Uh, my question is, uh, do you have a few simple examples of post-ROM solutions, something that um, the rest of us can use for our uh, general equilibrium Lagos tri cell models? So okay, can you repeat, uh, do you guys? Uh, do you guys have a simple examples like with log utility or something where we get close from solutions, something simple that the rest of us can use as a building block in our new no, model? But, okay. So let, let me, yeah, so I, let me go back. Quickly, let me go back to this. So that that's, that was the purpose of that slide, right? To say, so the first one I was, to, you know, with the first agenda where you bargain uh, gradually over the asset, right? So this would be the form of a. So you you can you could, could really write your your problem. I mean, you would use your Nash the way you do it, but you can see I'm doing that really at the margin over these infinitesimal units. So the formulas, I mean, they you know they they are this are this close form expression that we get. I mean, they, they are not hard to introduce at all. I mean, I think right if to Nash, they are easier. I mean, they, are, they are Nash, but um, at the margin, because everything is at the margin those moments, right? You price asset at the, at the margin, you make choice of rebalances based on the marginal benefits of this. So that's, that's all you care about. If you change the agenda in terms of, uh, I mean, the, in terms of the, the output, you go back to proportional. So, uh, I mean, any of those solutions, uh, you know, they are, they give you concave programs. Um, yeah, I think they are, they are, they are easy to, they are easy to solve. You, you don't have to use uh, all this, uh, all the, you know, the derivation that we, that we had earlier. You can, you can apply it like this. Yeah, so I was going to ask the same Lucas. So this formula for P at the bottom of this slide, so we can plug that into, you know, she, trails, right, or any other model. Right, just plug this in directly as their third equation in addition to the Bellman yeah. equation, yeah. and then yeah. see what you can prove. You know, yeah. it's known in those models, for example, you can prove some things with Pi, but not others. There are things you can prove with Nash, but not Pi. So it'd be interesting to see what you get with this. But the key, once again, this two is sitting there. That shouldn't be, there should be thetas in there. So you need to do the generalized version. No, no, we, we have the generalization in the, we have several of those generalization in the, in the paper itself. So uh, one way we generalize is uh, by varying, depending on when you are doing this alternating multimetamorphic, instead of having uh, equal bundle size, you can vary the bundle size uh, for one and the other in a way that is going to general, uh, give you a generalized version of that. 
So you can. Yeah, so my conjecture is the, the random offer gain instead of the alternating offer gain will give you the version of this formula where the thetas show up in the formula and they're interpreted as the probability the buyer makes the offer in any given round. And that's the yeah. formula I want so I can plug it into my models and then try to prove things. Yeah, so, but we, we have it in the, in the paper, Randy, and I agree with your conjecture as well in terms of this. Uh, what is the formula? I don't, I don't, I, it should be theta u prime plus one minus theta v prime in the denominator. I don't know what happens in the numerator. No, that's exactly what we have. The one, the one half is replaced by the ratio of the third one minus theta. Yeah, downstairs. What about upstairs in the numerator? Does anything show up there? Or is it, is it u prime times v prime over theta u prime plus one minus theta yeah. v prime? Is that the answer? Well, I, I, would need, I would need to check the... So the paper. To, I believe it's only that term that we have changed uh, as much. Yeah. That would have to be, yeah. that would have to double check that. Tell yeah, us. But, that. Oh no, I think I think you're right. I suppose that. I think yeah. Uh, but for yeah, but for the downstairs, it's just instead of two, you know, the formula for p of y is a two. In the denominator, you have theta u prime plus some like theta v prime, something and like that's that. That's the only difference. The yeah, numbers, exactly. They the same. Okay, so I'll I'll let you know what I come up with. Okay, thanks, Ronnie. Okay, thank you everyone. Then we will officially end the seminar today, but you are welcome to stay around if you like to discuss a little bit more. And as a participant, if you also like to join the meeting, just raise your hand and I can let you join the discussion as well. Thank you.